Congressman Andy Harris, it's such a pleasure to speak with you. It's a pleasure to be with you today. So I think, you know, the whole world probably knows, at least that has access to any form of media, uh, that uh, President Trump ha was diagnosed with uh, coronavirus, with uh, COVID-19, um, and uh, has been treated. And uh, yesterday he came out with a video, and I think another one today, really touting the virtues of this antibody cocktail, uh, I believe by Regeneron. Um, what are your thoughts here as a physician? Sure, so we know so much more since, uh, since this uh, COVID started in January. Uh, we know so much more about therapeutics and a wide range of therapeutics that really attack the virus in, and, and help in the disease in many different stages of the disease. And uh, the Regeneron product is a polyclonal antibody. Lilly has a monoclonal antibody. There will be other monoclonal antibodies uh, produced uh, that mimic your body's immune response. So, the, the, you know, the Regeneron product uh, designed after one, one of the naturally occurring antibodies. And, uh, you know, it, it's a great product. Uh, remdesivir uh, stops uh, uh, viral replication uh, in a person. So, you know, if you give the antibody, you kill anything that's in the bloodstream. If you give the uh, remdesivir, you stop anything in a cell from multiplying. And then, of course, the president got dexamethasone, which is, again, not, not, a, not a dangerous drug, but one which helps uh, ward off an inflammatory process that results in severe lung disease in some patients. So, uh, you know, before we go further, what exactly do, does therapeutics mean, like a therapeutic drugs? We've heard that brandished about, but I think a lot of us don't know. Sure. So you, you divide the, the, the drugs that we're looking uh, for in COVID can be divided in two categories. Uh, one is therapeutic drugs, actually could be three categories. One could be a prophylactic drug, something you give so that somebody doesn't get the disease. A therapeutic, something you give to someone who treats, uh, you know, who, it's a treatment for the disease. And then, of course, a vaccine, which also can be thought of as a prophylactic, a vaccine which would prevent someone from getting the disease. So the therapeutics are those those things that you would give to someone who has been diagnosed with the disease. So the president uh, in these videos, very upbeat videos, has said that he feels like I mean, he, he said that he feels like it cured him, this this uh, this this product. Now, we haven't heard that from his doctor uh, and I'm not clear what the progression of the disease. What What is the situation from from the information that's out there as best as you can tell right now? Sure. I mean, his physician has said he's not symptomatic anymore, and, that, and that's exactly what you'd expect from someone who's gotten a, a, uh, a polyclonal antibody that worked, uh, someone who's taking remdesivir. Again, you know, it, it, in, more, in uh, normal, healthy people, a lot of times this is just like getting a cold or a flu. Sometimes in, in two, three, four days, you feel much better. Of course, it lingers in some people, but again, uh, the president got therapeutics. They've been known to cut the duration of the uh, of the symptomatic disease process by three or four days. And sure enough, you know, four or five days later, the president is, uh, I'll put it in quotes, air quotes, good as new. So can we expect that this will last or is there is there any chance of a remission or, or sorry, uh, is there any chance of it coming back at this point? Is, you know, can we expect the doctor to say, finally, this is all clear? fully forever? <laughs> well, I, I think you'd have to wait uh, 10, to t 10 to 14 days to see, you know, that the president's uh, antigen count goes down and that the president might actually start testing negative uh, for the antigen for the virus itself in, in, in a few days. And uh, there, there is a, a later phase that some people get. But again, the, this president got the, you know, the up-to-date therapeutics that are soon going to be available to everyone. And Regeneron is in a study. It, it is it is available for compassionate use, and and uh, pretty soon I think it'll be available for any person who has uh, COVID. So, in someone who's gotten this the, this range of therapeutics, I'm not surprised that the president has gotten well so quickly, and I'd be very surprised if he had what you know we'd consider an exacerbation of the disease or the disease getting worse after it's gotten better. I, I just don't think that's going to happen, and the chance is uh, overwhelming that that won't happen for the president. Uh, the president has said that he wants to offer this free to people who need it, the, the antibody cocktail, so to speak. What does that actually mean practically on the ground for, for folks out on the street? 
Sure. So, uh, you know, I, I think what, what we're going to do, and a lot, there's been a lot of talk, for instance, that the vaccine, when it becomes available, is going to be administered at no cost. Uh, likewise, the government has invested, you know, tens of billions of dollars in developing these therapeutics, in producing uh, the therapeutics. Uh, so I think it would be perfectly reasonable for the government to say, you know, if you need one of the therapeutics, you know, we've paid to, to help with the research and development, we've paid to produce it. Uh, so for a while, and uh, you know, it, it could be available at no cost. I think that'd be perfectly reasonable. And so, is this like through the health, through the insurance? Like, how how would it, how does this work exactly? That's what I'm curious about. Sure. So, so it can work a couple of different ways. Uh, one way is we can just pay the company to make the drug, and then the U.S. just buys the drug from the company, and and, and it goes into normal distribution channels. Uh, you could reimburse on a per case basis, but I think the easiest way to do is just buy the drug from the insurance company, and as as we're going to do with the vaccine, and then just disperse it through normal distribution channels. So this has been described by the president and, frankly, uh, many others as a product of Operation Warp Speed, which is something that you've been very positive about as well. Can you actually explain what that is in some detail? Sure. Uh, you know, when I, when I was on the faculty at Hopkins, I mean, I participated in drug trials and trials for medical devices as well. Normally, they take years. There's a lot of red tape uh, in Washington uh, having to do uh, with, with uh, drug trials. And normally you, you design a trial, you do the trial, you wait for approval, and then you begin the manufacturing process. You contract out manufacturing. What Operation Warp Speed did, and, and it's brilliant, it's never been done before, it's unprecedented, is it said, we're gonna cut through all the unnecessary red tape with the FDA. Uh, we're going to work hand in hand with the private sector to develop these new drugs, like working with Reg Regeneron, uh, which, which was an Operation Warp Speed product, uh, to work with a company like that so that they are doing the testing. It's testing, uh, and the protocols are ones that, will, that the FDA uh, has agreed to up front are adequate protocols. And the most important thing is you begin to manufacture the product, especially with the vaccines, as you're testing it. Now, you are taking the chance that some of these vaccines won't work and we will have spent money to to produce a, a vaccine that will never work. But on the other hand, I expect most of the vaccines to work. And that means we will have hundreds of millions of doses by by the spring of next year, tens of millions by the beginning of the year, hundreds of millions by the spring. And and I think that that is what's going to shorten the pandemic in the United States. And when we ramp up production for the entire world, that's what will shorten the pandemic in the entire world. So for treatments such as Regener the Regeneron treatment, for example, um, how much faster is that than the typical length of time would be to, to get a drug like this approved? Oh, uh, you know, a drug like this could take three, four, five years to get approved. I mean, literally three or four or five years. And we're talking now eight months uh, nine months. Uh, it, it's it's phenomenal. And, and you know, all we've done is we, we've cut the red tape. You know, it, it's we haven't uh, haven't, you know, shortchanged on safety. We haven't shortchanged on efficacy. We've just cut through the red tape and encouraged production and in some cases paid for production while the approval while you're still in the approval process, which no company would normally do. They're not going to start making a drug until they're certain FDA is going to approve it. Uh, and that is significant because that that in and of itself has cut months to a year off the time uh, for availability of these drugs. No, so that's very that's one explanation why it's shorter. But it's almost hard to believe that that the red tape amounts to three, let's say three years. If that if what you just described adds it takes a year off, um, how, how does that work exactly? Sure. So, for instance, you know. Uh, when, when you're developing a drug and you're developing a trial, there's usually back and forth with the FDA about, you know, what is the FDA going to require? Do they agree with your protocol? Uh, and that back and forth, as you can imagine, if the FDA works hand in hand up front with the company, then that back and forth is eliminated. Uh, when, when the drug company, uh, ha they have to go to capital markets. You know, when, when you're doing a study, for instance, what some of these vaccine studies with 30 to 40,000 patients in them. Uh, that requires a lot of capital. So someone has to make the decision to invest that capital. Uh, again, with the government, with Operation Warp be saying, no, we're going to give you the capital. Don't worry about the capital. Just design the study, recruit the patients, get the results, 
don't worry about things like that. And then again, of course, production. You know, we're going to pay for production while you are in the approval process. And uh, that and all these things just cut literally cut years off the time. It is so unprecedented that we are probably going to have a vaccine within 11 months, 10 to 11 months of the Chinese releasing the uh, the genotype of uh, COVID. That's interesting. What, what do you mean exactly? What's the China connection here in your view? Sure. So uh, so China uh, released. Uh, we, well, they didn't release it, actually. It was released by a scientist. And then, uh, you know, China had to agree that, yes, that 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 is, in fact, the genotype. It may not have been the genotype uh, or the gene sequence of the of the original virus, but it's it's among the first few generations of virus. So it enabled uh, the the mRNA vaccine manufacturers, uh, Moderna, Pfizer uh, and their partners to actually design the antigen, design the vaccine based on the genetic sequence of that virus. And that using using messenger RNA, that has never been done before. Uh, and, and it will cut it will cut years off the uh, time to develop a vaccine. It is the latest technology. America has been investing in it uh, for several years now uh, in the NIH and through uh, BARDA, one of the health and human services agencies that is the, uh, you know, the Biologic Advanced Research and Development Authority. Uh, the, we have been thinking about this for years. We're putting it into practice and uh, cutting years of red tape off of this. And this is very, very significant because as we go forward, it's not a question of if there will be another virus like this. It's only a question of when there will be another virus like this. Uh, so th we, we, are, we will be much, much better prepared uh, for the next time than we were this time. And uh, you know, we did lose critical time uh, with China not revealing uh, the genotype, not admitting that there's human to human transmission, kind of hiding the severity of this. But we've made up a lot of that time with Operation Warp Speed. Now, that's interesting. If I recall, the, the gene sequence was actually posted somewhat illicitly. Yes, that's right. And, and uh, then and then China just had to admit, yes, in fact, that's the gene sequence. But you're right. It was not it was not authorized officially. Uh, but fortunately, you know, someone with good conscience uh, published it illicitly. I suppose that's uh, that, that's a real whistleblower. Hey. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and that person will will end up saving tens of thousands of lives because, uh, look, we would when the virus uh, got here uh, sooner or later, we would have gene it. We would have gene sequenced it. But that cut weeks off of that process. And when you cut weeks off a, a worldwide pandemic, you're saving tens of thousands of lives. You know, that just makes me think of, again, how I, what I often do is how I think of how uh, Secretary of State Pompeo distinguishes between the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese people. A absolutely. Look, uh, it, it, it's, the, it, the China, Chinese Communist Party that was hiding this, not the Chinese people, the Chinese Communist Party. And in fact, uh, Chinese scientists and doctors, as we know, were in fact uh, trying to get the message out. Some of them giving up their lives trying to get their message out. Uh, but yes, it, it, there's a the clear distinction. It is the Chinese leadership in the Communist Party that uh, that misled the World Health Organization, that misled the world, kept tried to keep this hidden. And again, thank goodness that Operation Warp Speed is making up for some of that lost time. So, you know, again, as a physician. Today, for the typical person, like I said, the typical person on the street, um, there's a lot of mixed messaging uh, about how worried you should be and who should be worried, frankly. And I'm wondering sure. if you could just kind of break that down from your perspective. Sure. So at this point, it looks like when you take into account the number of known cases plus the people who are asymptomatic and we never even knew they had the disease, it looks like the fatality rate is going to be somewhere about two in a thousand to maybe four in a thousand. That's roughly uh, up to twice the fatality rate of the flu. And some people think uh, as, as our therapeutics get better, we will approach the fatality rate of the flu uh, and maybe even be less than the fatality rate of the flu because we don't develop, for instance, monoclonal antibodies or polyclonal antibodies to, to, the, to the flu every year. So uh, what, what I tell people is, look, uh, this, is a, this is a virus that transmits pretty easily. 
But right now, because of the therapeutics we have, and, and because we, are, we know who we have to protect, that the risk is right now to the average person is about the same as the flu. And we know that people accept that risk routinely because only about half the country, less than half the country, actually gets a flu vaccine every year. And we know that we don't stop schools. We don't, we don't shut down, uh, you know, we don't shut down businesses for the flu. So we're approaching the time where, where we really have to begin to think of this as just like a flu season. Maybe, one, maybe a bad flu season, but a flu season. And uh, we don't, and again, a lot of Americans, they know the flu is out there, but they don't obsess about it. They don't worry excessively about it. If they get sick, they, they go to the, they, you know, they ha may have to go to a hospital and get treatment, but that happens normally in a flu season. We're at the point where this really just has to be treated like the flu. So if you are, uh, I believe it's above 70 and or have pre-existing conditions that, you know, make you vulnerable, um, what is your best course of action at this moment? Sure. Until we get the vaccine, and again, I believe within two months, two to three months, that we will have the vaccine available for those high-risk individuals. But until we have that vaccine, you know, you have to uh, keep yourself as isolated as possible, not total isolation. But if you're going to go outside, you know, wear a mask. If you're going to, uh, you know, if you're going to uh, go, go in public, don't go in large crowded places. You know, do the common sense things if you're at high risk. But these are the same things you would do in a flu season if you're at high risk. You know, you would get a flu shot. The first thing you do is you'd get a flu shot. Uh, then you would you would make certain that, uh, you know, if you felt bad or you got a fever, you'd go and see a doctor right away. Uh, but, but the most important thing is until those vaccines come out for roughly the 10 percent of Americans who are would be considered high risk. And again, it's a matter of a few months until this vaccine is out. You know, continue common sense measures. Uh, like social distancing and wearing a mask. And just so for, for the record, the, the mask is interesting because, there, again, there's some considerable debate about the value of a mask. Of course, the masks don't actually stop the virus from passing through, at least maybe the N95 ones do, but most of the recommended type masks do not. Uh, what is the utility of that? So it, it turns out that actually a mask, the, 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 even a regular surgical mask, does two things. One is it, it decreases your ability to spread the virus if you're an asymptomatic individual. But you're infected, you have the virus in your nose and your throat. If you cough or sneeze or speak loudly or sing, then uh, you can transmit that virus in air droplet, in uh, small air uh, water droplets. Uh, the mask will stop that. But there is some evidence that there, is, that there is a slightly decreased risk of you getting infected as well by wearing a surgical mask. Uh, and the most intriguing thing is that, the, uh, it, that it's pretty clear that there, uh, to be infected, you have to get a certain number of virus particles entering your, have to enter your body. And that if a, if a small amount enters your body, you either don't get sick or you get a subclinical illness and develop antibodies. So it, it's it's uh, so actually wearing a mask by decreasing the amount. Of, and, and you're right. You do not eliminate. There is no question about it. Wearing a surgical mask does not eliminate uh, aerosolized particles uh, from from going behind the mask and you breathing them in. But there is evidence that it that it can decrease the severity of, of the illness or you may not get ill at all, even though you're exposed to some of the virus or even more interesting, you could develop immunity to it without ever getting ill. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, so any thoughts before we finish up, Congressman Harris? Just that, you know, I, I think the president was, was right, on, right on target in his comments a, a few days ago when he said, we, we can't be afraid of this. Uh, you know, this, is, this really is, at this point in time, just like the flu season. And, uh, and again, we, we, we can't, over, can't overcompensate for it. We certainly uh, should be looking at, at reopening schools. There's no question about it. Yet protecting those high-risk individuals that, like you had mentioned, the elderly, people with coexisting uh, uh, conditions, especially heart, uh, kidney, uh, liver, lung conditions, diabetes, and uh, wait for the vaccine in a few months. Uh, so the light is clearly at the end of this tunnel. There's no question about it. Uh, and the president uh, and the administration with Operation Warp Speed has brought us much, much closer to that light at the end of the tunnel, much faster than anyone would have imagined. 
If we just go back a few months, we have experts like Dr. Fauci saying it might be the end of next year before we get a vaccine. Everybody now agrees we're going to have a vaccine by the end of this year or the beginning of next year. So, so even the experts, you know, again, who had predicted 2 million deaths. And remember, at the very beginning of this, the prediction was 2.2 or 2.3 million deaths. We are at one tenth that level and we are nearing the end of this pandemic. Uh, so it's just it's it's a uh, there. It's a time to be optimistic about this. Let's get things reopened. Let's get our economy going. And, you know, let's get back to a normal life as soon as possible and then help the rest of the world get back to a normal life as soon as possible. Uh, such a pleasure to speak with you. It's a pleasure to be with you today.